a friendly geriatrician from Palo Alto, California. I give thanks first to Creston for arranging this. I think it's a very important sequel to a whole series of efforts to try to upgrade our understanding of aging and science in general. I also have some major thanks to give to people such as Leonard and also very importantly to Harold Morowitz. Who's one of, Harold's one of my intellectual heroes. His book, Energy Flow in Biology, which is 50 years old now, but it is still a standard and I recommend it heartily. Also, Jeffrey West is one of my heroes. I've been to Santa Fe and given a talk there and was kind of speculating on thermodynamics of aging and they say, don't talk to us about it, it's a tautology. We just, it's a given. You don't have to convince us of everything. And the other is Robert Laughlin, whose book, A Different Universe, Robert? talks about the end of reductionism and the emergence of emergence. And emergence is also something that Harold has proclaimed, and I've learned a lot about that and look forward to talking to you about it. <clears throat> but I have a couple little themes to develop. One is the purpose of this conference, I think, is to create a new paradigm. And you're trying to shift biology into a more physical domain. I have had a parallel effort in my field of medicine because I'm embarrassed about my field. We've got all the money, that's true, but we have few ideas and certainly nothing that's doing us much good. When you see that the life expectancy in our country is way down, I could logically say, what are we spending our money on? So I wrote this book for Oxford two years ago and was very well received reviewed in Science and JAMA and the Wall Street Journal, and I brought a few extra copies I'm happy to give out to anybody who'd be interested. I gave grand rounds at Stanford and many other institutions about it, and the common comment about my presentation is, Walter, it's wonderful, but it's wishful. What do you do with wishful? Oh, but it were that way, and I try to invoke a physical basis for medicine which has to do with the second theme of my thing. Namely, when I was in my 30s, I pulled my Achilles tendon off skiing at Stowe, Vermont, and when my leg emerged from its cast, six weeks later, I looked down at my leg and saw, my God, look at that leg, it's an old leg. It was painful, purple, withered, functionless. I said, what happened to my leg? It wasn't causing pull pulled a tendon off, nor was it because it was old, it got old, it got that way because it was in a cast. So I planted the little idea in my mind that there was a great homology between disuse and aging. And I went to the Stanford Library and found very little about disuse. I got a lot of help, however, from NASA because it was just at that era that space medicine was coming out, and space medicine is, in effect, accelerated disuse. You go up in space, you just sit there. You don't work against gravity. So the body goes to hell in a hurry. So all these references I then codified into an article I wrote in JAMA in 1982 called Disuse and Aging. And it makes the point that much of what we think of as aging isn't aging, but it's a fact of lessened energetic flow through an organism. So that's the drum that I've been beating ever since. Subsequent to that, I wrote an article called The Physics of Aging, and I recruited a friend of mine by the name of Gene Yates. I don't know if many of you know Gene. He's a UCLA guy who died recently because he fell off his exercise bicycle and broke his cervical spine. But Gene was important because he gave us the term homeodynamics. He took issue with homeostasis, which is Walter Cannon's term of 100 years ago, which is fundamentally errant. Everybody can identify that. So Gene then conceived the term homeodynamics, which tries to reconcile all the stuff that's going on, which is cosmically complicated. And in my paper that I came out on that, uh, I say there's a large segment of human illness that is neither time-driven nor illness-driven, which derives instead 
from an inappropriate non-optimal energy flow. The clinical applications of this are immense. Counter strategies are simple, safe, universal, and cheap. As the context of human illness is enlarged to encompass a thermodynamic interpretation of the interactivity between the body and its environment, medical science achieves a higher plane of consonance with universal law. So within that philosophy, I described something that I call the disuse syndrome. And the disuse syndrome then is cardiovascular vulnerability, musculoskeletal fragility, immunologic susceptibility, metabolic frailty, not due to an extrinsic agency nor to a moment, but to a system. So out of this, I was conformed to try to say, why did my leg grow old in a cast? And I was talking at the Fairmont Hotel in San Francisco a few years ago, and a fellow in the audience put his hand up and said, have you read Prigogine? And I'd never heard of Prigogine, but I made quick to read his book, Order Out of Chaos, and I subsequently met Prigogine at his home in Austin. He was dying of kidney failure. He was on dialysis at that time, but I put my thesis of the thermodynamics of aging to him, and he felt congenial, as did Linus Pauling, my, another of my friends in Palo Alto, because I wrote another paper in 1986 called Aging as Entropy. Because as I was trying to imprint aging my thoughts of it in a thermodynamic, it fits so comfortably. Linus said, that's clever, Walter, but it's poetic said, you can't use entropy in that phrase. It belongs to us in a cuvette. It's really not subject to you using it biologically. Nonetheless, that paper was published, and it led to my meeting with Prigogine and other endeavors with my friend Gene Yates and with the help of the Ellison Foundation and the NIH we put on a conference at the NIH 10 years ago called the Dynamic and Energetic Basis of Health and Aging. And it tries to conform this idea there's a new paradigm that's neither agent nor single moment, it's system. So the conclusion of our three-day international meeting, we wrote Zerhoni, Sir head of the NIH, we suggest the following. One, ditch the Gene Institute, close it, instead start the Institute for Systems Biology. Whereupon Zerhouni chooses Francis Collins to be the head of the NIH. And so our su suggestion of a systems institute lies languid still. But still it tries to capture this notion that there's a bigger paradigm and the paradigm of medicine until now has been disease, and I claim that that's the wrong paradigm. The right paradigm for medicine to embrace is health, but all the money's in disease. In my book, I claim that the problem of the medical system now is it's a collision of biology and capitalism. We want to fix you. We are a repair shop. We want to drug you. We want to instrument you but we don't want to prevent you because that's too simple. There's no money in it. So at Stanford, we're the mother church of genes, and I have kind of fought that philosophically and really. One day, Kornberg was talking about the elucidation of the human genome, and I said, Arthur, well, I don't see that in my practice. I don't see genes. What I see is behavior. He says, Walter, there's no science in behavior. There's only science in genes which is reductionism in the supreme. But he was wrong, and I had the opportunity to support a young postdoc at Stanford. His name is Shiraz Patel, and he was hired out of Stanford because he was not gene-driven. He started a term that we will hear about soon, called EWAS, Environment-Wide Association Study. So it's not the organism, it's the organism in its environmental context. So GWAS, in our estimation, has seen its day. I think its reductionism has left us. But EWAS is now 
coming out very powerfully. But I would like to make a case history for you because the other issue that happened was my father died when I was 39 and I was crushed. I was emotionally bereaved. I couldn't work, sink, anything. So being a physician, I knew that the best treatment for depression was exercise. So I put my shoes on and started running around the block at age 39 and I've run a marathon every year for 43 years in a row. And I'm 85 years old, I was at Boston when the bomb went off, and I'm healthy, except that three weeks ago I started to fibrillate, and my heart is now da dum ba da dum ba da bum ba da bum which has a thermodynamic explanation because the gallons of blood that have been going through my heart stretched the atria and tented the conduction fibers. So I have to turn myself into the electrophysiologists on Monday to see what they're going to do with my skippy heart. But I use that just as the case example of how medicine can be looking at engineering principles within human illness that goes way beyond our traditional drug-driven, procedure-driven thing, but unfortunately, which pays well. So I characterize Stanford as a body shop. It's just putting up a big, brilliant new emporium of sickness. And I talked to the director, I said, what are you doing to keep people out of the hospital? No answer to that question. Because all the money is in full beds, and all the money in Congress is in disease. So we need a new paradigm. So the new paradigm I'm offering is next medicine, prevention instead of repair. But I think you all, we all, are working on a new paradigm for biology. And that's what I hope that I learn and take from this meeting. And thank you, Creston, for putting it together. Any comments, criticism? Yes, I, have, I have a question, actually, of the other experts in the audience. Um, the, um, is there any credibility to the idea that the mechanical use of parts damages them and therefore induces a repair mechanism that refreshes things? And that's how it works. In other words, is there any credibility idea that what, what you're doing is you're invoking a repair mechanism that is normally dormant right. uh, by putting a, a little bit of stress on the system, but not a lot. Right. I gave a talk at the Cooper Institute in Dallas, and Cooper challenged me. He said, Walter, you're using up all your free radicals running up these hills. Well, that's true. I'm using them, but I also my repair molecules my glutathione reductase and lactase all are way upregulated. So the neck burden of free radicals in my birth life are much less. Same for heartbeats. When I'm running up a hill in Portola Valley, my pulse is 150. As I st well, if I were in normal rhythm, my pulse would be at 40 now. So the net product of physical energy throughput upregulates the whole system in anabolic enzymes. Okay. Any other uh, comments, questions? Thank you. Yes, sir, please. <clears throat> so is it conceivable that these systems, when you make this transition, if you've got the system, our lovely biological system, no genome change, no proteome change, all right? But the system is still going to degrade because of a just the entropic alteration in the unique nonlinear set of controls that are. At I that think there's point in time. there's noise. I, I don't yeah. think there's any right. escape from noise. And yep. Robert knows this stuff better than I. But they're now into this nanotechnology down at the, what's the noise? What's the chatter between the atoms? And there's a lot of chatter going on there. And it's my sense that when we're fit, fitness is a 30-year age offset. And the best biomarticle that I know about is called VO2 max. 
VO2 max is you put a clip on a nose and a mouthpiece on a treadmill. And how you extract oxygen is the VO2 max. And that is a 30 year age offset. I had mine done recently and I got through the treadmill and I said, Walter, you're 50. But in fact, I'm 80. But I'm 30 years offset because of this. I wrote a blog, I write a blog for Huffington every week. I said, exercise is the oboe's A. Before the concert starts, the oboe plays an A, and the whole orchestra then comes into a harmonic to that. So it's my sense that the metabolic field, I coined that term when I was, I talked from Schrodinger's lectern in Trinity a couple of years ago on the plasticity of human aging, and I claimed that what we need is better linguistics, and I, I suggested the term metabolic field to encompass all of this interplay that is so cosmically complicated, but we lack a good metaphor, so I suggested that metaphor at that time. But nonetheless, it all still comes down to energy flow, which is Harold's great contribution to us. Other comments, critiques? I'm not sure I have a very good question, but so your metabolic networks, I mean, so I'm trying to understand something on a more molecular level. So the exercise supposedly, as you say, uh, puts in harmony some metabolic networks operating in the cells. In order to influence other mechanisms, repair, let's say DNA repair uh, and so forth, these networks have to be coupled. But we know for sure that the metabolic networks are kind of isolated from the other networks. To some extent, at least, well, not completely isolated, of course, but, but the links are weak. Um, so I wonder if anybody is working on that, trying to identify how the metabolic network drives the other mechanisms. Well, Jeffrey that, that is my expert on all of these carlisms and right, scaling. So maybe Jeffrey's the one who has to take well, wait, wait till later then, wait okay. till later. Uh, <laughs> There's a term that I didn't like but to interrupt. Right. No, they are, and, and, and I was going to disagree with you because they're, they're no, all I, interconnected. That's what I'm saying. I yeah. don't know it enough, but yeah. it, it, it there's a wonderful so. word that I learned called symorphosis. Anybody know that word? Symorphosis. Uh, whenever I invite somebody to Stanford, of note, I go and do a <coughs> literature search, and I had Jared Diamond up uh, after his big book. And so I go, uh, and what's he written lately? And he wrote a book, a paper on symorphosis. Symorphosis is what you think it is. And it is an empirically sound idea of how the different systems scale to throughput. And the most critical one is VO2 max. It's how we take oxygen and move it. And all the components sequentially scale precisely. They have to, otherwise you would have a, a block. You would have a block in it. So the system has to go up and down in terms of its gradations to Jeffrey's scaling mechanisms. I think 